Right, folks, um, thanks for joining us tonight. Um, I'd hope to do this talk tomorrow on the uh, anniversary of the ending of the Second Boer War, but the slot on our uh, provider has already been taken, so we're doing it a day early. Okay, so Second Boer War, various other names. Um, it's lasted from 11th October 1899 to 31st May 1902, and it was fought between the British Empire and two independent Boer states, the South African Republic, which was also known as the Trans as um, Republic of Transvaal, and the Orange Free State. And the war was basically over um, the United Kingdom's attempt to enforce uh, its dominance in the area. Bekuana, Bekuana Land Protectorate, which is now Botswana, um, was a British protectorate. Just to the north of Transvaal, you have um, Southern Rhodesia, which was a British um, colony. Swaziland was um, British controlled. And then to the um, northeast of Transvaal, you have of Portuguese East Africa, which later became Mozambique. So you can see that um, the two Boer states um, are basically surrounded by British colonies or British protectorates or areas where the British had um, influence. The war, Second Boer War, is also known as the Second Anglo-Boer War or the South African Boer War, but I've never heard it referred to as Boer War II. In this talk, I'll be using the phrase Boer War for simplicity. Two campaign medals were issued um, for men who served in the Boer War, and you can see them on either side of the screen. One was issued with the head of Queen Victoria on the obverse, and one was um, issued with the head of King Edward VII on the obverse. And the uh, reverse of the medal was the same for both um, the Queen South African medal and the King South African medal. The reverse features a, an image of Britannia. Her traditional trident and union flag are lying beside her, um, but she's holding a laurel wreath in, in her right hand and a flag in the left hand, looking over um, a column of soldiers. And in the background to her left is a warship, a battleship of the Royal Navy. Um, the two medals, Queen South Africa Medal and King South Africa Medal, were both issued with a number of clasps. So men who were involved in different battles or different engagements um, would have received different clasps on the medal. This is something which was done quite consistently during the 19th century. But when you move into the um, 20th century, and particularly in the First World War, the Great War, um, you don't generally have clasps attached to service medals. The only service medal which has a clasp is the 1914 star. And that's if um, that was only issued to men who were part of the original British Expeditionary Force. Um, Second World War was slightly different in that uh, different medals were issued for different campaigns, which is a, a, a totally different ball game. So um, I'm going to be running through quite a few memorials of different types. And um, at each for each memorial, for most of the memorials, I'll be talking about an individual. A lot of the memorials are based, are memorials to individuals. Um, there are five regimental um, memorials and there's two um, bat um, battalion level memorials. So I'm going to start off with this one, um, uh, a memorial window in Bangor Parish Church. It was designed and installed by Heaton Butler and Bain Studio in London and the theme is the armour of God. In the first panel a servant is fitting um, spurs to the figure um, of the of the Earl, and it is a, I'm informed it is a, a very passable likeness of the Earl. So the spurs are being attached. Um, there's a gauntlet lying on the ground. And in the lower part of this panel is the coat of arms of the Earl of Ava. At the base of the second panel is the insignia of the 17th Lancers. In the upper part of this panel, a dagger is lying on the floor whilst three female figures are waiting to present the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, 
and the helmet of salvation to the faithful warrior. So that's the iconography of that window. Um, it is a particularly fine looking window. I, I, I'm only working the basis of photographs I've seen. Haven't had a chance to visit and photograph it yet. On the other side of the screen is the memorial that was erected at his um, place of burial. So Archibald, Earl of Ava. The window was unveiled by Duchess, the Duchess of Montrose on 25th September 1900. And amongst the attendees were two men, the Reverend Maguire, Dean of Down, and Mr. R. H. Reed, Deputy Lieutenant, both of whose sons were to die during the Boer War. And both of them are also commemorated in stained glass windows, which I will come to in, in due course. The reason why I've just put Archibald the Earl of Ava rather than his full name is because his full name was, deep breath, Archibald James Leofric Temple, Hamilton, Hamilton Temple Blackwood. So he had a triple barrel surname and four forenames. He was born on 20th July 1863, being the eldest son and heir of the Marquis and Marchioness of Dufferin and Ava. He was educated at Eton and received a commission with the 17th Lancer, serving for some time in India during his father's term of office of the, as a, the Viceroy of India. There's a statue in the grounds of Belfast City Hall um, for the, uh, the Marquis of Dufferin and Ava from his time as Governor or Viceroy of India. He also served in, the, in South Africa under Lieutenant General Lord Methuen before relinquishing his commission. After leaving the army, he's a bit of an adventure type of chap, he prospected for gold in the northwest of Canada. I'm not sure whether he made any money out of it or whether it was successful, but when war broke out, he went to South Africa as a war correspondent and proceeded to Ladysmith. He was shot in the temple at Wagon Hill on 6th January 1900 and died of his wounds on 11th January. A relatively plain memorial was erected at his grave by a few of those who were with him during the siege and the dedication records that he was mortally wounded whilst fighting in the front line of the Imperial Light Horse. Now, it's unclear whether um, he, having gone to South Africa as a war correspondent, as a civilian, whether he subsequently received a commission into the Imperial Light Horse, or whether it's because he was um, taking messages from um, the local commander to the general when he was mortally wounded, whether that's uh, whether they're just according him the, the the dignitary of being with the Imperial Light Horse. I haven't been able to fathom that one out because I haven't been able to get um, anything concrete which says he was definitely recommissioned into the army. So it's a bit of a, an unusual one as to whether he was a civilian or whether he was um, military. Following the return of the Imperial Yeomanry to Ireland, several districts issued commemorative watch chain fobs to mark the occasion. Uh, I know that Dublin issued ones to men um, from the Dublin district, and this particular one um, was issued to men of the Imperial Yeomanry from London Derrien district, and it was issued or handed out by the Lady Mayoress of Derry in a ceremony on the 28th of June, 1901. The text engraved around the rim reads, in recognition of his gallant service in the South African campaign. The shield bears the inscription, this particular one, presented to Trooper J. Campbell by the mayor and citizens of L. Derry, way ahead of their time there. And the issue, the date of issue, the dates 1900, 1900 to 1901 are engraved below the shield. And my thanks to Stephen McCracken, a relative of um, Trooper Campbell, who sent this, um, these photographs to me. Joseph Campbell was born around 1864 near Limavady and was a farmer when he enlisted in Belfast on 10th January 1900. His overseas service commenced on 3rd March and he was serving with the 46th Belfast Company 13th Battalion Imperial Yeomanry when he was taken prisoner at Lindley on 31st May 1900. His unit had entered Lindley on 27th May, but soon retired to a defensive position northwest of the town, where they were forced to surrender on 31st May. Ironically, 
Lord Methuen's relief column arrived the following day. Joseph um, was released from captivity on 23rd August 1900 at Breda and resu um, returned, resumed home service on 5th of March 1901. He was discharged at his own request from further service in connection with the war in South Africa on 16th April 1901. Joseph Campbell was awarded the Queen South Africa Medal with the South Africa 1901 Cape Colony and Orange Free State clasps. So obviously his period of captivity um, meant that he didn't want to go back to the, the war zone, although I'm not sure that the Imperial Yeomanry were likely to be sent back to the, um, to the South African campaign by that time. The first local memorial, um, external as opposed to windows, um, in fact, the first one to be erected full stop, commemorates the fatalities from um, Brookborough in County Fermanagh. It was unveiled by Lady Brookborough of Coldbrook House in August 1901. And um, the Portland Stone Memorial stands 10 feet high and the base is a six foot by six, six foot six inches square. And it was designed and constructed by Mr. John Hart, who was a local stonemason. It is in three distinct parts. Uh, the lower part of the pedestal features an engraving of a pith helmet under which are inscribed the names of the three fatalities from the area. When the memorial was erected, it only bore the names of two men, Sergeant William Brown of the Royal Enniskilling Fusiliers and Private William G. Palmer of the Prince Alfred's Volunteer Guard. In 1902, the name of Robert Noble of the Royal Army Medical Corps was added. Between the base and the pedestal um, is a frieze on which the flowers of the three parts of the United Kingdom are engraved. And those are, of course, the Rose of England, the Shamrock of Ireland and the Thistle of Scotland. Wales does not get a mention. On the front of the pedestal is a trefoil containing shamrocks and the year 1901. So that's this bit up here. The insignia of the Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers is engraved on one side of the pedestal. So you can see here, the Inniskilling Fusiliers. And on the other side of the pedestal is a star and a slouch cap. I'm not sure of the relevance of that or whether it's just a general um, image associated with the South African War. On top of the pedestal is a lion resting its right paw on a shield bearing the arms of the Royal Enniskilling Fusiliers. So that's way up here again. In contemporary reports, the lion is described as being a rampant lion, but it isn't. Um, I'm not quite sure how you would describe it, but certainly when you look at the standard of Scotland, the Royal Standard of Scotland, which features a lion rampant, you can see that that's not the case. Indeed, on the 26th of August, 1901, the impartial reporter published a letter from somebody signing themselves as Viator, in which the correspondent stated that the lion, quote, is not a real representation of the British lion, but represents quite a different species whose characteristic is cowardice and not courage. The correspondent pointed out that the positioning of the tail between the hind legs symbolized defeat and submission. Some people just pay far too much attention to detail. So who were the three men? Sergeant William Brown died on 21st April 1900 at Ladysmith with 1st Battalion Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers. Um, Private Robert Noble died of disease on 27th December 1901 at Pretoria. And the third man, um, on 30th December 1900, a train carrying 68 British soldiers and 40 civilians was ambushed in a railway cutting between Sherborne and Rosemead in Cape Colony. Um, they were attacked by a party of Boers led by Gideon Sheepers. The British troops held out until they had no more ammunition and they were captured. None of the civilians were harmed. Private William C. Palmer was killed. Three soldiers were wounded. And um, as I said, none of the civilians were harmed. So moving on into um, September 1901, a stained glass window again in Bangor Parish Church 
commemorated the death of Captain Charles James Kinahan Maguire of the Royal Sussex Regiment. The window was the, again the work of Heaton Butler and Bain Studio in London, and the upper light features Joab and the Israelite army, whilst the lower light features Christ with Mary and Martha. The window was unveiled by the Marchioness of Dufferin and Ava on 13 September 1901, and it was dedicated by the Reverend John Baptist Crozier, Bishop of Ossory, Ferns and Leichlin. He was later to be, um, be become Archbishop of um, Ireland, of the Primate of Ireland in the Anglican Church of Ireland tradition, and he was the second or third man to sign the Ulster Covenant. Um, Charles James Kinnan Maguire was born on the 31st of March 1872 at Dunluce Rectory in Bushmills. The Reverend Edward Maguire, who had attended the, um, the unveiling of the memorial window for Archibald um, Earl of Ava, and his wife Mary Kinnahan. He was commissioned as a second lieutenant with 5th Battalion Royal Irish Rifles, known as the Royal South Downs Militia, on 31st March 1889 and entered the Royal Sussex Regiment in March 1892. He was promoted to Lieutenant in May 1894 and to Captain in April 1899. At the commencement of the Boer War, he was serving at the Regimental Depot in Chichester, but he volunteered for active service, joining 1st Battalion in South Africa in April 1900. Captain Maguire was killed in action on 12 June 1900 at the Battle of Diamond Hill, or Slag von Donkerhoek, as it's known in Afrikaans. And that took place on the 11th and 12th of June in central Transvaal. Captain Maguire, who is also commemorated on a family memorial in Bangor Old Abbey Graveyard, which is this memorial here, he left £122, 9 shillings and 11 pence, which is approximately £15,190 in current terms. And the money went to his father, the very Reverend Edward Maguire, Dean of Down. Possibly my favourite of the, the stained glass windows um, for the Boer War is this one, which is in St Mary's Church of Ireland in Newry. This uh, heavily watermarked image, because I haven't photographed it yet, is from the www glowin.ie website and that's a website which documents uh, stained glass windows in Church of Ireland buildings across the island of Ireland. And this commemorates um, Thomas Walker of the Ulster Imperial Yeomanry and it was erected by public subscription. In one panel is a Red Cross Knight um, resting his hand on a sheet, right hand on a shield whilst his left hand grips the, um, the pommel of his sword. He's bareheaded, but otherwise armoured and ready for the fray. The face of the knight, again, is a true representation of Thomas Walker. The other panel features an angel bearing the helmet of salvation, reaching it out to place it on um, Thomas Walker's head. The window was dedicated on 2nd March 1902 by the Right Reverend Thomas Welland, Bishop of Down, and Connor and Dromore. Thomas Walker was born on 11th April 1873 at Hill Street in Newry to Abraham Redmond Walker, who's a miller and merchant, and Mary Medill. He was a sea captain when he enlisted on 8th January 1900 in Belfast, and his service in South Africa commenced on 3rd March. Private Walker was serving with 46th Belfast Company, 13th Battalion Imperial Yeomanry, when he was killed in action on 31st March 1900 at Lindley, in the same engagement in which Trooper Joseph Campbell was taken prisoner. Thomas Walker was awarded the Queen's South Africa Medal with the Cape Colony and Orange Free State clasps. Um, this memorial window is in Down Cathedral, and it commemorates Captain James Thompson Seeds of the 5th Battalion Royal Irish Rifles, known, as I said before, as the Royal South Down Militia. The window was designed and installed by Heaton, Butler and Bain Studio in London. There's a surprise. And the stonework was the work of s and Hastings stonemasons of Downpatrick. Um, they also did the, uh, the Downpatrick War Memorial. And I have a sneaking suspicion that the family is connected to the Hastings Hotel family. 
The theme is Christ with Mary and Martha, and the only military aspect to the window is the insignia of the Royal Irish Rifles, which you can see right up at the top of the, the window, um, with the Royal Irish Rifles crowned Harp of Erin and the Sphinx to um, denote the regiment's um, involvement in Egypt. And below that is the, um, the horn uh, that indicates that it was a light infantry regiment. The upper portion of the second panel includes the text, Dulca ed decorum est pro patria mori. The window was dedicated by the very Reverend Edward McGuire, the Dean of Down, on 15th December 1902. And of course, that's the father of um, the Maguire I was talking about just a few minutes ago. So he was involved in at least um, three memorial windows for the Boer War in different um, aspects. It was unveiled on 15th December 1902. George Thompson Seeds was born on 26th October 1870 to William Seeds and Elizabeth Atkinson of Ballymote Downpatrick. He was educated at the high school in Dublin and then at Trinity College. He gained his Bachelor of Arts degree in 1895, his Master of Arts degree in 1898, and his doctorate in law in 1899. James Seeds was a barrister at law and living at Palmerston Park in Dublin when he received his commission as a second lieutenant on 4th February 1899. He, he was promoted to lieutenant in May 1900 and to captain in March 1901. He volunteered for active service and proceeded to South Africa in April 1901. Captain James Thomas Seeds died of dysentery and heart failure at Kroonstadt on 1st June 1901. In his will, he left 5,246 pounds, 18 shillings and one penny. And that's just over 650,603 pounds in current terms. And he left his money to his brother, Captain Arthur Atkinson Seeds of the Royal Army Medical Corps, who also served in the Boer War. Moving into Belfast, and this stained glass window is in Belfast Cathedral. And it commemorates Lieutenant Robert Ernest Reed, DSO, of 1st Battalion, the King's Royal Rifle Corps. And the associated dedicatory panel includes a, a lot of detail. As you can see, it, it um, records that he served in the Battle of Talana Hill, the retreat from Dundee, the Siege of Ladysmith, and he received his Distinguished Service Order for conspicuous gallantry at the Battle of Wagon Hill. It then goes on to, to say that a year after the relief of Ladysmith, he was mortally wounded in an encounter with Boers and died two days later. A monument marks the spot near Boschman's Pan, about 25 miles southeast of Middleburg, where he was laid by his comrades. It gives his date of birth, 29th April 1879, and his date of death, 4th February 1901. Um, it was erected by his father, R. H. Reed. Uh, Deputy Lieutenant, who lived at Wilmont in County Antrim. The window was designed by John William Brown of the James Powell & Sons Studio in London. The main part of the window feature, features an Israelite warrior, Joshua, and the lower portion features the spies returning from Canaan. I've not been able to identify details of the unveiling and dedication of this window, and my Contact at um, Belfast Cathedral hasn't been able to find the details either. Robert Ernest Reed was born 18th April 1879 at Wellington Place to Robert Henry Sturrock Reed, a linen merchant, and Dorothy, Dorothea Emily Florence Robbins. The Reed family home was at Old Forge in the Malone area. Robert Reed Sr. was chairman of the York Street Flax Spinning Company in 1911 and was made deputy lieutenant for the county of Belfast. Robert Ernest Reed was commissioned as a second lieutenant on 15 February 1899, and his first major engagement in the Boer War was at the Battle of Talana Hill on 20 October 1899, and the subsequent re um, retreat from Dundee. That's not Dundee in Scotland. Obviously, there's a Dundee in um, South Africa, as there is a Belfast, where there is a battle, and a Belmont, where there is a battle. He was at the Siege of Ladysmith and was awarded the Distinguished Con Service Order for a conspicuous gallantry at the Battle of Wagon Hill, which was fought on 6th January 1900. One year after the relief of Ladysmith, 
Lieutenant Reid was mortally wounded in an encounter with a Boer unit in northeast Transvaal on 2nd February 1901 and died two days later at the age of 21. He was laid to rest by his comrades at Bachmann's Pan um, to the southeast of Middleburg and a monument was erected. On 19th April 1901, the London Gazette reported that Lieutenant Reid had been made a companion of the Distinguished Service Order in recognition of his um, services during the operations in South Africa. The first of the um, regimental related memorials is this uh, brass tablet in Down Cathedral, which commemorates the lives of Captain Seeds, four non-commissioned officers and 26 riflemen from the 5th Battalion Royal Irish Rifles. The tablet also names two riflemen from 4th Battalion, the Royal North Down Militia, who were attached to 5th Battalion at the time of their deaths. The tablet was unveiled and dedicated on 17th April 1903 by the very Reverend Edward Maguire, Dean of Down. The first fatalities named on the tablet were Robert Briggs and Thomas Carr, who were both killed at Red Reddersburg in April 1900 when a Boer force led by General Christian de Vett, attacked the convoy of 600 men from the Royal Irish Rifles on 4th April and obtained their surrender the next day. Robert Briggs was born on 4th March 1866 at Haslam's Lane in Lisburn to Andrew, Andrew Briggs, a butcher, and Mary Ann McBride. Robert was working in the family firm when he enlisted with the militia in February 1884. Thomas James Carr was born on 10th April 1876 at Irish Street in Downpatrick to Nicholas Carr, a publican, and Mary Ann Ranahan, and he enlisted with the militia in June 1893. Both men were mobilised for war service on 15th January 1900. The militia regiments were reserve regiments, so um, when you were in the militia, you had to provide a certain amount of service every year, generally at an annual camp. And so long as you attended annual camp, you were kept on the books, but you were liable to be mobilized for um, overseas service in the event of um, a war or um, some other military action. They were both posted to 2nd Battalion on 8th, 18th January and were both killed in action on 4th April 1901. Robert Briggs was 55 years old when he died and Thomas James Carr died six days before his 25th birthday. The last man named on the memorial to die was Sergeant James Bell, who died at Kroonstadt in 1902. James Bell was born in 1859 at Ballyroney near Rathfyland and enlisted with the militia in August 1887, having previously served in the regular army. He was mobilised for war service on 10th May 1900 and died of alcoholic poisoning on 25th May 1902, aged approximately 42 years. In 1904, two memorials were erected in Lisburn in memory of Major Thomas Roger Johnson Smith of the 1st Battalion Durham Light Infantry. The memorial tablet on this side of the screen is in Lisburn Cathedral whilst the memorial window is in Christchurch, Lisburn, and it was designed by Heaton, Butler and Bain Studio in London. I think they must have had a contract with the Church of Ireland to do um, uh, stained glass windows because their name crops up time and time again. It was dedicated on Sunday the 24th of April 1904 by the, by the Reverend Richard Usher Greer, Rector of Christchurch. The Reverend Greer would later serve as a chaplain for the Ulster Division until his death in June 1915. Thomas Roger Johnson Smith was born on 12th June 1857 in Lisburn to Matthew Johnson Smith and Elizabeth Corkin, Elizabeth Ann Corkin, and they lived in a house called Ingram in Lisburn. He represented Ireland at rugby on one occasion as a forward against England at Lansdowne Road on the 6th of February 1882. He married Everina Frances Elizabeth Adams in 1885 at Holy Trinity Church in Folkestone, Kent. She was the beneficiary of his will, the effects being £303 and one shilling, which is just over 38000 in current terms. 
In September 1878, he received a commission with the 106th Regiment of Foot, which was amalgamated with the 68th Regiment of Foot to form the Durham Light Infantry under the 1881 Childers Reforms. He was promoted to Lieutenant in April 1879 and Captain in February 1885. He was part of the Sudan Frontier Field Force in 1885-86, being awarded the Campaign Medal and the Khadiv Star. I'll come back to those two medals later on. He's wearing these medals in this um, image of, of um, Thomas. He attained the rank of Major in August 1896 and embarked for South Africa with his battalion in October 1899. On 5th February 1900, after emerging from the left bank of the Tugela River, the 1st Battalion Durham Light Infantry came under severe rifle and artillery fire. They withdrew to the cover of the river bank, but Major Johnson Smith had been mortally wounded in the engagement. Major Johnson Smith died during the Battle of Valkrans, an attempt to break the siege of Lady Smith. He was buried in the military cemetery at the foot of Valkrans, where a marble cross marks his final resting place. 1904 was a, a, a very busy year for Boer War memorials, in that two memorials were erected in the, the west of Ulster. On Wednesday, 21st September 1904, the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, William Humble Ward, 2nd Earl of Dudley, unveiled the memorial in Enniskillen to commemorate fatalities from two regiments, the Royal Enniskilling Fusiliers and the 6th Enniskilling Dragoons. The obelisk stands 34 feet in height and was funded by public subscription and it was built and erected by Robinson and Son of Belfast. The dedicatory inscription reads, in honoured memory of the 20 officers, 47 non-commissioned officers, and 215 men of the 6th Inniskilling Dragoons and Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers, who, sustaining the great reputations of these distinguished regiments for prowess in arms and devotion to their so sovereign and country, fell in battle or died of wounds or sickness in South Africa, 1899-1902. One face of the obelisk bears the insignia of the um, Inniskilling Fusiliers or the Inniskilling Dragoons, which is this face here. And the associated face of the plinth down here records the surnames of 80 fatalities, six officers, 13 non-commissioned officers and 61 privates. But, but there's no four names. The names are just listed one after the other and it's just surnames. Two of the faces of the obelisk bear the insignia of the Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers and you can see one of them here and also on the older photograph here and the associated faces of the plinth record the surnames of 204 fatalities 15 officers 34 non-commissioned officers and 155 privates there are 284 names on the memorial now two names having been added after the unveiling the memorial was originally located in the square at the end of Belmore Street, close to the Great Northern Railway Station. And it was moved to its current location near Enniskillen Castle around 2007. And that was because um, there's a lot of um, redevelopment around that, around that part of Enniskillen at the time. Big shopping center was being built and this was an obstruction to traffic. But it's somewhat interesting that for many years, there was a war memorial at either end of Belmore Street. The uh, Boer War Memorial at one end and the memorial that was erected for the, um, the Great War at the other end of Belmore Street. On Friday 25th November 1904, a monument to commemorate the fallen just of the Royal Enniskilling Fusiliers was unveiled in Oma by Her Grace Louisa Hamilton, the Duchess of Abercorn. The monument originally stood in front of the courthouse at the top of High Street. As you can see there, the courthouse at High Street and the monument. And for some reason, um, it didn't sit right in the middle of the road. It was offset to one side, which is a bit unusual. <coughs> it was relocated to its um, present site on Drumra Avenue in 1964. Again, mainly due to increased traffic within that thoroughfare 
and it created somewhat of an impediment, a bit like the original Titanic Memorial in Belfast, which was later moved into the grounds of the City Hall. Um, the central granite pedestal supports three bronze um, figures. The two figures on either side of the monument represent war and death. You can possibly see it clear on this side. On this side, you have war. So you've got a female figure with a sword and a shield. And on this side, you've got um, death, which is, again is a female figure. And in her arms, she's holding um, flowers. The central figure symbolizes victory, overcoming war and death. The figure is holding aloft a laurel wreath in her left hand and is holding a palm frond in her um, right hand. The bronze figures are the work of Sidney March, um, an English sculptor. On either side of the monument are copper relief panels depicting an officer and a private of the regiment. At the front and rear of the monument are copper panels on which are named fatalities from the regiment in battalion order. The, um, the panels and the, the two relief panels were cast by the Elkington Foundry in London. Based on the transcription on the Irish War Memorials website, this memorial commemorates 207 men from the Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers, 15 officers, 33 non-commissioned officers and 159 privates. For those of you who are paying attention, you'll realise that the number of fatalities on this memorial is three less, is three more than the number of names on the Inniskillings panels on the memorial in Inniskillen. So whether, um, and as they were both unveiled very close to one another, it's unlikely, it, to me, it's unlikely that they would have come across an extra three men in that period of time. But it could just be that um, there could be some people, some men who died who were officially part of one of the reserve battalions and were on attachment um, to uh, the, the Inniskilling Fusiliers. And as such, one town decided to include them and the other town decided not to. But again, it's interesting that there are these um, discrepancies between memorials. Moving on to probably my favourite Boer War Memorial, and that's the Memorial for the Royal Irish Rifles in the grounds of Belfast City Hall. Uh, this image of the unveiling of the memorial um, is from the Irish War Memorials website, www.irishwarmemorials.ie. If you're interested in war memorials, I um, would advise you strongly to have a look at the website because it is a, a fantastic um, archive. Um, you can see that the statue is facing the, the red brick building, which is still on the corner of Donegal Square East and Chichester Street. The Royal Irish Rifles Memorial, as I said, in the grounds of Belfast City Hall, was unveiled on Friday, the 6th of October, 1905, by General the Right Honourable Lord Grenville, Grenfell, Commander-in-Chief of the Forces in Ireland. And it was in a ceremony that was hosted um, by the Lord Mayor of Belfast, Sir Daniel Dixon. The memorial commemorates the fatalities from the two regular um, army battalions and those from the mil uh, militia and volunteer battalions. And those were the 3rd Battalion, which is the North Irish Militia, 4th Battalion, Royal North Down Militia, 5th Battalion, Royal South Down Militia, 6th Battalion, Louth Militia, and the 16th Mid Middlesex Volunteers, um, London Irish Rifles. The memorial stands um, 20 feet high with an eight foot bronze statue of a rifleman in an at the ready pose with rifle and fixed bayonet and he's standing on a rocky outcrop. The 15 foot um, granite plinth has a bronze dedicatory panel which features and at each corner, sorry, there's a bronze dedica um, de dedicatory panel at the front and there's a belt of bronze panels with figures at each corner representing war, victory, death and fame. The front panel features the crowned harp and the light infantry horn of the, of the regimental crest with the regimental motto, 
Key Separabit. On either side of that, there are laurel branches. The other three panels list the names of the 132 fatalities by battalion and then by rank and surname. And in total, there are four officers, 18 non commissioned officers, and 110 privates. As with the memorial in Oma and in Askillan, the sculpture. As with the memorial in Oma, the sculptor was Sidney March and the bronzes were cast by the Elkington Foundry in London. And these are the four um, figures that are at the, the corners of the, um, the belt that runs round the side of the memorial. So you've got three or four angelic figures, all are female and all are scantily clad. War is depicted with um, a fire, um, with a fire and a sword, and the shield. Uh, so the sword's in the right hand, and the shield is in the left hand. Victory is depicted by a figure with a laurel wreath in her right hand and a palm frond in her left hand. Um, so that's very similar to the the one in Oma, only they're reversed. In Oma, the laurel wreath is in the um, left hand and not the right hand. Death features a figure with flowers in her arms, which again is very similar to the in thematically with um, the memorial in Oma. And fame is depicted by a figure sounding a clarion call on a horn of some description. An additional bronze plaque has been added to the memorial to recognize those who served in the 83rd County of Dublin Regiment of Foot and the 86th um, Royal County Down Regiment of Foot between 1793 to 1881. Those two regiments of foot were amalgamated um, under the Childers Reform to form the Royal Irish Rifles. And then from in the Royal Irish Rifles from 1881 to its disbandment in 1921. And in the Royal Ulster Rifles from 1921 to its amalgamation with the Royal Irish Fusiliers and the Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers in 1968, forming the Royal Irish Rangers. The worst single day in the Boer War for the Royal Irish Rifles was at the Battle of Stormberg on 10th December 1899, with 2nd Battalion losing 12 other ranks. In addition, five officers and 46 other ranks were wounded, and four officers and 216 men were captured. The commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Henry Averill Eager, died of his wounds on 3rd February 1900. For many years, a memorial service was held at the monument each December to commemorate this battle. In 1966, there were only seven survivors from the rifles and only one man was on parade, and that was Corporal Valentine Silcock from Eden near Carrick Fergus who laid the wreath at the memorial. At the memorial. You can see um, from the image on this side of the screen that he was in such frail health that he was accompanied by, by two nurses. He was um, to die in 1967. In 1968, there were only three Boer War veterans in Northern Ireland, and Thomas Smith of Dulch Road in Newton Abbey was, one of, was the only one on parade that day. So even though uh, it became a Royal Ulster Rifles um, memorial service from 1921 onwards, and obviously as the Boer War veterans died off, but there were still men from the Ulster Rifles who, who held the service in memory of their predecessor regiment. The fund to raise capital to erect the memorial to the fatalities from the Royal Irish Fusiliers was launched in 1902, late 1902. However, as no indication had been given as to the form of the memorial, some potential su subscribers expressed a reticence at making donations. One potential subscriber in writing to the Belfast newsletter um, said, you know, people didn't know how much to contribute because they didn't know what it was going to, what the memorial was going to be. In his letter, he said that he would happily subscribe a hundred pounds, which is about twelve and a half thousand in current terms if the memorial was, was to take the form of a soldier's home. He didn't say how much he would contribute if it wasn't to take the, um, the form of a soldier's home. 
In October 1903, <coughs> pardon me, the Belfast Evening Telegraph reported that the Irish sculptor Miss Kathleen Shaw had created a model of the proposed Memorial Celtic Cross based on the ancient cross in the grounds of the Protestant Cathedral in Armagh. The cross would have been 11 feet high and would have featured engravings of biblical characters and scenes and events. So it would have been like um, the, the high crosses where stories were being told in the engravings. In the end, the War Memorial Committee decided that the memorial should um, have a, a martial and military flavour. And Miss Kathleen Shaw was engaged to design the memorial as it is now, which was unveiled in the Mall in Armagh on Saturday 6th, October 1906, by General the Right Honourable Lord Grenfell, Commander-in-Chief of the Forces in Ireland. Pardon me. The theme of the memorial is the last post, and it features an eight-foot-high bronze figure of a bugler standing on an outcrop of rock. The front, the front, <coughs> the front face of the Irish granite plinth features a bronze shield with the L emblems and battle honours of the regiment, with a frieze of shamrocks round the side, and the battalion war cry "Foch a bala." at the top of the, the shield. The names of the 166 fatalities are incised on the three faces of the plinth. Eight officers, <coughs> 27 non-commissioned officers and 131 privates. Um, on the inscriptions, where there are fatalities with the same surname and initial, the regimental number has, has been incised as well. The most senior um, officer of the regiment to die was Major Frederick Henry Munn. And he was born in September 1857, educated at Shrewsbury School in England, and entered the 89th Regiment of Foot in September 1876, being promoted to captain in March 1883 and to major in July 1888. The 89th um, Princess Victoria's Regiment of Foot um, amalgamated with the 87th Royal Irish Fusiliers Regiment of Foot to form the Princess Victoria's Royal Irish Rifles under the 1881 Children's Reforms. <coughs> Basically, the Children's Reform took a lot of uh, single battalion regiments of foot, infantry regiments of foot, and amalgamated them um, to form a two battalion infantry regiment. So in general, um, the uh, the regiment which had the lower number, in other words, the higher precedence, would become the 1st Battalion, and the other regiment being incorporated would become the 2nd Battalion. So the 87th Regiment became 1st Battalion, and the 89th became 2nd Battalion. Um, Mun served with the 2nd Battalion in the Sudan Expedition in 1884, being president, present in the engagements at El Teb and Tamai and received the Campaign Medal and the Khedive Star. I mentioned these earlier, but these are them at the side here. Um, the Campaign Medal for Sudan, 1884, and the Khedive Star for the same year. Um, the Khedive Star was also issued at, for another campaign in 1896. But on this particular one, that I've lifted from the internet. It says Egypt, 1884. So that was the Sudan exp expedition. It has Egypt because it was the Khedive of Egypt that issued the medals. Major Munn was deployed to South Africa with 1st Battalion in September, 1899. He was president, present at the Battle of Talana Hill, the retirement on Ladysmith and the action at Lombard's Cop. In November 1899, pardon me, in November 1899, the Illustrated London News reported that he was a prisoner of war. He subsequently commanded a detachment which was attacked at um, Vitport on 16th July 1900, his orders being to, quote, hold it at all costs. The Boers called on Major Munn to surrender, but he held out from daybreak 
till 2 p.m. when the enemy retired. Field Marshal Earl Roberts telegraphed, quote, the fight on the 16th was most successful. I heartily congratulate you and all concerned. And in his dispatch of 10th October 1900, um, Field Marshal Earl Roberts reported that the detachment had greatly distinguished itself. Major Munn was again mentioned in dispatches on 1st March 1902 and awarded the Distinguished Service Order. He died of measles and pneumonia at Springfontein on 31st August 1901 and was buried in the military cemetery. He was awarded the Queen South Africa Medal with the Orange Free State, Transvaal, Talana and South Africa 1901 clasps. This um, brass tablet in a marble surround is in St. McCartan's Cathedral in Enniskillen and it commemorates the fatalities from 1st Battalion Royal Enniskillen Fusiliers. Again, I've been unable to find out any details about who designed the memorial or when it was unveiled. The memorial lists the names of 105 fatalities, 13 officers, 32 NCOs and 140 privates. The names are arranged in four blocks. The first block names the 13 officers along with the date and place of death. The second block lists the 24 men, six NCOs and 18 privates who died at the Battle of Colenso on 15th December 1899. The third block um, lists 71 men, 13 NCOs and 58 privates who were killed at the Battle of Pieters Hill on 23rd February 1900. And the fourth block of name, names lists the 77 men, 13 NCOs and 64 privates who died in other actions or from disease. The rank of one of the fatalities is recorded as boy. Robert Hood Arthur was born on 26th June 1883 to Sergeant John Arthur, Arthur of the Royal Enniskilling Fusiliers and Letitia Glass. And um, he was born in Lifford. Robert Arthur was a tailor when he enlisted on 16th July 1897 and he died of disease at Maritzburg on 23rd August 1901 at the age of 18. He was entitled to the Queen South Africa medal with the Cape Colony, Transvaal and South Africa 1901 clasps. To the best of my knowledge, the only school to erect a memorial to specifically commemorate the Boer War was Pretoria Royal School in Enniskillen. Goes under a different name now, but to me it's still Pretoria. The wooden tablet lists the names of 57 old Pretorians who served in the war with three names marked with a cross to identify those for whom there is no earthly homecoming, as, is, as the wording on the plaque says. Sterling Kellett Oakes was born on 14th March 1878 at Glendermott in Londonderry to Surgeon Major Frederick Aston Oakes of the Army Medical Department and Hannah Selina Kellett. Trooper Sterling Kellett Oakes was serving with C Division of the South African Constabulary when he died of fever on 22nd March 1902 at a military hospital in Vinburg. The South African Constabulary was a paramilitary force set up in 1900 by the British Army to police the areas that had already been captured from the two independent Boer republics during the war. So in other words, after they had captured a, a portion of territory, rather than having um, soldiers um, acting as garrison, they, they had this South African constabulary to, um, to keep an eye on things. The first um, inspector general of the South African constabulary was someone who I'm sure most of you, if not all of you will have heard, and that was Major General Robert Baden-Powell. Sterling Kellett Oates was awarded the Queen South Africa Medal with five clasps, Cape Colony, Orange Free State, Transvaal, the 1901 clasp and the 1902 clasp. The only memorial that I've been able to find in County Londonderry is this tablet in St. Columns Cathedral in the city. Um, again, I've not been able to find out who designed it or when it was um, dedicated or unveiled. 
but it was born. It was it commemorates Kerr McClintock, who was born on 5th August 1867 at Hampstead Hall in Templemore near Londonderry to Captain Thompson Mackay McClintock, JP, late of the 87th Regiment of Foot, and Sarah Maria McCausland. His father was a landowner with properties on the Inner Shore and Peninsula, and Kerr enlisted with the Cameron Highlanders in Edinburgh on 29th May 1889 at the age of 21. Served in Malta from 1892 to 1895 and held the rank of sergeant and was serving in Gibraltar when he brought himself out of the army in December 1895 on the payment of £18, approximately 2,400 quid in current terms. Trooper Kerr McClintock was serving with the Imperial Light Horse when he was killed in action on 21st October 1899, age 32, during the Battle of Enslachte. Um, to the best of my knowledge, the last memorial to be erected in connection with the Boer War was a memorial in connection with the Imperial Yeomanry Units from Ulster, and it's sometimes referred to as the Ulster Imperial Yeomanry Memorial. In addition to the 29th Battalion Irish Horse, the 46th, 54th and 60th Squadrons were associated with Ulster. And as you can see, it says, um, raised in the nine counties of Ulster. The memorial was unveiled in Belfast City Hall on Saturday the 10th of March 1956, 54 years after the war ended, um, the memorial was erected and dedicated. It was unveiled by Lord Mayor, Alderman Robert Harcourt, and dedicated by the Dean of Belfast, the very Reverend Robert Cyril Hamilton Glover Elliot. The memorial does not list the names of the fatalities, um, and there were only eight Boer War uh, veterans present at the ceremony. One of them was a, a recipient of the Victoria Cross who also served in both world wars. And that was Robert Scott VC. He was born at Haslington in Lancashire on 4th June 1874 and he enlisted with the Manchester Regiment on 2nd February 1895. He was serving with 1st Battalion in Natal when the war started and went through the, ladies, the siege of Ladysmith without being once absent from duty. He was awarded the Victoria Cross in January 1900 and a citation reads, R. Scott, Private, and J. Pitts, Private, 1st Battalion, the Manchester Regiment. During the attack on Caesar's camp in Natal on 6th January 1900, these two men occupied, occupied a Sanger on the left of which all our men had been shot down and their positions occupied by the Boers and held their, their post for 15 hours without food or water all the time under an extremely heavy fire, keeping up their fire and a smart lookout, um, though, they occupied, though the Boers occupied some Sangers on their immediate left rear. Private Scott was wounded. After recovering from his wounds, Scott was employed at the regimental depot as a regimental quartermaster sergeant, a role he held again with the 3rd Battalion during the Great War. After 28 years service, Robert Scott retired and moved to County Down, where he joined the Royal Ulster Constabulary, becoming a sergeant and serving at the RUC depot in Newtonards. The RUC depot in Newtonards um, was at the, the army camp that was um, there uh, during the Great War where uh, units of the Ulster Division trained. With the outbreak of the Second World War, despite being 65 years old, Robert Scott um, sought to re-enlist with the Manchester Regiment. However, obviously he was turned down for active military service, but he did serve in a security capacity with RAF ground staff. Robert Scott died on 22nd February 1961 at the age of 86 and was buried in the cemetery of Christ Church, Church of Ireland in Kilkeel following a military funeral. His grandson, senior air craftsman Dion Carr, bore Scott's scarlet Boer War tunic adorned with the Victoria Cross and his various service medals. On 10th May um, 1961, 98, a memorial plaque by the War Memorial for Mournview Presbyterian Church 
was unveiled by the British Legion. Another plaque that was unveiled at the same time was for um, the uh, was for um, for Hannah, who won the VC during the Great War. I'm going to finish off this talk with the man who sent me on this voyage of discovery about Boer War memorials. John Cleland was born on 7th April 1871 at Kilmood near Kalinchy to John Millen Cleland and Mary Barclay Dixon. His father later married um, Sarah Johnston on 22nd October 1885 at Hillsborough Pres Presbyterian Church. John and Sarah were both national school teachers and in the 1901 census, the family was living at Main Street in Hillsborough and his father was recorded as being a teacher of chemistry, physics, science and botany. John Cleland was a chemist and a member of the Royal Irish Rifles Militia when he enlisted with the Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers at Oma on the 11th March 1890. His period of engagement was seven years regular service and five years reserve service but he extended his regular service in 1897. He served with the 2nd Battalion in Iskilling Fusiliers during the 1897-98 Northwest Frontier Command, being awarded the India Medal of 1895 with the Punjab Frontier 1897-98 and Tira 1897-98 um, clasps. So that's the, the medal which is on this side of the screen. I've lost my place. He was wounded during the Second Anglo-Boer War while serving with 1st Battalion and Iskilling Fusiliers. On 30th March 1900, General Redvers Buller wrote to the Secretary of State for War listing cases of distinguished conduct in the field. Lance Corporal John Cleland was included in the report and he, as he had rendered very valuable assistance to wounded under heavy fire on 23rd, 24th February. John Cleland held the rank of Sergeant when he died of dysentery on 8th May 1901 at Middleburg, and that's in Transvaal province. In addition to the Distinguished Conduct Medal, he was awarded the Queen's South Africa Medal with four clasps, Belfast, Cape Colony, Tugela Heights, and the relief of Ladysmith. For those of you that are familiar with the Distinguished Conduct Medal from the First World War, you'll see that the, uh, the detail on the Distinguished Conduct Medal for the Victorian era was considerably different. Uh, it's a far more complicated, detailed medal compared to the, the later medal, which basically just had the, the profile of the monarch on one side and for distinguished conduct um, on the other side. And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings this talk to an end.